Good morning and welcome to worshiping in our Zoom sanctuary at Brentwood Presbyterian Church out here in Burnaby, British Columbia on Sunday, May the 9th. This is Mothering Sunday, as uh, some of us call it. And we're going to take a look at the Great Affirmation yet again. We've come to the end of our exploration of Paul's conversations with the Corinthian Church. And so we're going to take a look at this uh, passage that Canadian Presbyterians consider to be the central affirmation of the great truth of the gospel. So thank you for joining us, whether you're here in person or whether you're visiting us online after. For those of you that are with us in our Zoom sanctuary, you'll be muted for most of the service. There's the chat box that we use for the word to ponder, the prayers of the people. Here's what happens over the next hour or so. We see the triune creator, the Trinity, drawing us into a safe space of hospitality, hope, and healing for conversations that nourish us to flourish in our lives in that creator's world. We're welcomed by God. We wonder at the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ that generates wisdom for our missioning, for our life in the world, and we're equipped to be witnessing partners with the Spirit in caring for God's creation. That's the scope of the salvation that we under understand ourselves having been incorporated into and participating in. So thanks for participating in this time of worship uh, with us. We do acknowledge that the Brentwood buildings uh, sit on the traditional and unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. For that, we are deeply grateful as well as respectful. And we remind ourselves every Sunday that in 1994, the Presbyterian Church in Canada confessed to our misrepresentations of Jesus in so many of our relations with our Indigenous kin. And we pray that as we move forward from sovereignty to stewardship and our mutual care of God's creation, that we can find new ways of being with those peoples and learning from their wisdom. And as we come together in worship, let's listen again for Ben McRae's composition of The Meeting House, played by Ben and Dan. Let's welcome each other into worship. You draw us here with welcoming love from neighborhoods of struggle and strife with stress injuries of all kinds. In the safety of this sanctuary, you heal us into greater wholeness, nourishing our souls to flourish in your grace. So in this time together, in this place, at this point in our lives, Inspire and equip us to be faithful, wise, and effective ambassadors of your forgiving and reconciling love. And let's sing our Christ candle hymn.
Let us pray. Rainbows are a symbol, dear Lord, of your love for your creation. It is the wonder of that love that we explore together this morning. And may we sense more deeply its hope and its healing. Let's appreciate God's grace again together with these by now for many of us familiar words. Your merciful grace, loving Trinity, constantly works to transform our lives. You take us from wandering to wondering, from the dark to the light, from isolation to community, from confusion to clarity, from despair to joy, and from death to eternal life. Make us ever more grateful for this redemptive power in our lives and guide us to represent your reconciling grace wisely to bless this world. And I just want to comment for a moment on this uh, familiar, but I think still wonderful and evocative um, image of the prodigal son, a story that's so central to us here at Brentwood. Uh, it was painted by an artist by the name of Sister Francis, and it's, it's on the walls of a convent in, in Spain. I tried to find um, somewhere to get permission to use it. Um, can't find that. I, I keep looking, uh, but I know that it is being used in a number of other places. So I uh, just wanted to uh, uh, comment on it because it, it's one of the most powerful images that I've run across. The hymns this morning are the two hymns that we used when we first looked at this passage uh, back in January, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, uh, and then later We're Cross the Crowded Ways of Life. Again, a quick comment about the image we're now using for the prayer of illumination. This is a, a painting uh, painted by our friend down in Jamaica, um, Earl Mackenzie. He's a wonderful poet and painter, um, is one of the recipients of the Mulgrave Award down there, which is their equivalent of our Governor General's Award for his poetry. Um, but uh, we have the original of this painting and it will, when we get back together face to face, it will be hanging in the church. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. And our reader this morning is Ben McRae. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Our Old Testament reading today is Psalm 98, Praise the Judge of the World. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. 
The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And our New Testament this reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God requis- in, that is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the written word of God, a witness to the living word, Jesus Christ, understood through the witness of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. God. So our word to ponder this morning is affirmation. As I said before, and as I'll say again in the sermon, Uh, This is a word used by the Presbyterian Church in Canada in its uh, contemporary statement of faith called Living Faith um, that applies to this passage. So this is the the great affirmation, the core affirmation of the great truth of the gospel. So what does affirmation suggest to you? You can either uh, write in the chat box or um, feel free to unmute and speak into the service. You can just press your space bar uh, when you want to speak and um, and then lift it up when you are finished. Okay, ongoing. Mm, solidifying. Oh, I like that. Uplifting encouragement. Foundation. Ah, to make good, yes. Thanks, Alice. Attesting to, yeah. Ah, at times a challenge to accept, you think, Dan, Ben? We spent a lot of time talking about that at Bible study on Wednesday. uh, Those of us that gather have started calling ourselves the rabbit hole gang because we keep going down these wonderful rabbit holes um, at the uh, prompting of the spirit. Validated, yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Eric, that's great. Restate a value. Ah, restate a value or goal. Yeah. So 
support. Yeah. Well, as always, don't hesitate to continue to write your ideas in the chat box as we go through this uh, next phase of the conversation um, where I get to talk. <laughs> uh, just a comment about the picture that goes with the sermon and, and with the, uh, the readings, uh, the, the uh, uh, word to ponder this morning. This is a cross again. It's a piece of art that hangs in the church right now, but it was uh, made by the children in the Christian urban camp. I think this was the first, first or second summer that we did it. Um, so Christian Urban Camp is a day camp that we do with kids in New West and Burnaby. Um, it's a joint project of what we call the collaborating churches. So Brentwood, St. Aidan's, Gordon, and, and Knox. Uh, because of the daycare and, and everything we do it, for the, uh, we do it over at um, those three churches. And then First Church in New West also collaborates with us in this program. Uh, but they did these wonderful, they're white tiles and they brought fancy paint that you kind of put on and it spread out. And it was wonderful. We got the little cross because we didn't really have space. The other congregations got big six foot crosses. We figured we didn't have room for that. So <laughs> we got the little crosses. But let me go back and, and reread uh, what Ben's already read for us. In Christ... God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting there our trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So on this Mothering Sunday, in the midst of the great pandemic, now I think we have to say the pandemic of the 2020s, uh, when so many mothers have died, many of them in an isolation and loneliness that, that wrenches our souls. We have our attention drawn this morning, maybe, maybe dragged is a better image, a better metaphor, back to the seminal affirmation that Paul preaches as he tries to make sense in community of his salvation. Now, it seems to me of crucial importance as we come to the end of this round of conversations about the records that we have of the dynamics within the Corinthian church as they compose their missioning, much as we're composing our missioning in our city, in our time. I think it's crucial that we keep in mind the origin of Paul's faith. Paul's faith in Jesus as the Christ, in whom the Creator saved the world. Paul's faith in Jesus as the Christ, in whom the Creator saved the world, including all of the human creatures that are inhabiting it. That origin, if you remember, was an encounter. It was an event. It was a meeting, an engagement, and it began with a question, a question that Jesus posed to the person then being called Saul. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? On the Damascus road, on the road down to Damascus, to continue to do his dirty work, Saul gets stopped in some kind of blazing, revelatory experience. A light descends, and from that light, the voice comes, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? In recounting this event in Acts chapter 9, Luke reminds his re readers and hearers that Saul was still, this is the language he uses, Saul was still breathing 
threats and murder against the disciples of Jesus. And he was on his way to Damascus to continue to do that. And Saul, I suspect with more confused insolent insolence than Luke suggests in these few words, replied, who are you, Lord? Bit of confusion, bit of insolence, but that's the language that Luke records. Who are you, Lord? Jesus identified himself as the one being persecuted. And he sent Saul off to become Paul, to become Paul in the care of the Christian community in Damascus, to ponder in blindness for three days, in the dark, for three days, among the people that he was on his way to destroy, what this event, this encounter, with God in Christ, through the workings of the Holy Spirit, was all about. Now, I imagine there are variations of Jesus' question that might emerge in such encounters today, however they may be experienced. And in North America, they might be a little different from, why are you persecuting me? They may come in this form. Brian, Brian, why are you ignoring me? Brian, Brian, why are you misrepresenting me? Brian, Brian, why are you oppressing and tyrannizing in my name? Brian, Brian. Why are you killing and destroying in my name? But what Paul comes to realize, and note the transformation in the name from Saul to Paul, what he comes to realize in the context and care of the Christian community, this, this doesn't just happen between Jesus and Paul. This is a community event. This is Jesus incorporating Paul with every dimension of that image that you can imagine into Jesus' people, into the people of God. What he came to realize in the context and care of the Christian community then was that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the incarnate presence of the God who he had been serving, of the God of the Jewish people who were expecting the Messiah to come, certainly not in the way Jesus came. But in that presence of Jesus of Nazareth, stunning, scandalous, and foolish as it seemed, Saul's God was forgiving and reconciling the world, back into that God's original vision of a kinship, of a family. Now, some of us are slow learners. I mean, really slow learners. I'm just speaking for myself here. I'll focus on my remarks on this forgiving and reconciled person, Paul, and my sense of my incorporation into the body of ambassadors that is the church. Part of my slowness is, involves how long it took me to notice that this passage from 2 Corinthians that we're considering this morning had in fact been designated by living faith. Living faith is the, is the uh, our denomination's official short statement of Christian belief um, that we, we did back in the 70s, I think. Um, and it became one of our, what we call subordinate standards. So it was a, a way in which we understand ourselves to be formulating the faith for our time and our place. 
Um, it's, it's, a, it's a formulation of belief that points to and tries to express in words our understanding of the event, of the encounter, of the, the, the salvation that we are given by God in Jesus through the work of the Spirit. And our Brentwood Declaration that we read every week that we remember every week is rooted in, in, that, in that statement of faith. But in the introduction to living faith, it says that this passage, this verse in fact, is the core affirmation of the great truth of the gospel. And I shorten that to the great affirmation of the gospel. And it's striking what Living Faith goes on to say in clarifying this. The living God became the person of Christ and walked in our midst in a world that is an, to an astonishing extent shared, uh, that, that to an astonishing extent shared many of the same problems we do now. If God could get involved in the grim fabric of life, love that phrase, the grim fabric of life. And so can God's church. And so too must the faith that we confess. And so the great affirmation has to do with God acting. God acting in an event, in an encounter, in an embrace of us with forgiving and reconciling love so that we can be the blessing God created us to be. So in the midst of all the wranglings and hasslings that hindered a faithful, wise, and effective missioning in Corinth, Paul keeps being brought back to this central affirmation. Often, I suspect, from the evidence in the letters and in other letters, he was dragged back kicking and screaming. He, by his own admission, is all too human in this way. He doesn't like being challenged. He doesn't like being demeaned, being dismissed. He can get testy and contentious. I mean, after all, he's got years of practice in that. And he's good at it. But the triune creator is better at what the triune creator wanted Paul to do. He wanted him to be an ambassador of that triune creator's forgiving and reconciling love. That reality is at the core of everything we know about Paul and his missioning. He wasn't always good at it. He wasn't always perfect at it. But he always called himself and his companions back to this great affirmation as the core principle around which, the core chart, I can use a jazz phrase, around which we improvise our witnessing and witnessing to the gospel. And Jesus, that God's Christ, was God's primary ambassador the first fruits of the new humanity is another way Paul talks about it, was the primary ambassador of that God's forgiving and reconciling love. And that Christ is with Paul, is in Paul, and in some of the places Paul actually seems to suggest that Christ in fact is Paul. I mean, it's that level of intimate embrace. And in that intimate embrace are potent possibilities that are frankly beyond our imaginations until we actually see them in action or hear about them in action, until we hear and read the stories of what the Spirit is enabling, until we accept Paul's invitation to participate in all of this to represent this forgiveness and reconciliation literally in every encounter we have in our lives.
as we sense and feel in our hymns this morning, and hopefully in the whole service, the divine love that excels any other love is directed at the crowded ways of our lives today. As it has been for countless generations who've gone before. And Jesus' questions about why are we persecuting, ignoring, misrepresenting this forgiving and reconciling love of God continue to confront us with invitations to go out and be a blessing, to transform the ways in which we live in God's world, the ways in which we mother God's world, in companionship with our triune creator, in companionship with the Holy Family. Someone in our Bible study this week was remembering Paul Young's uh, book that came out several years ago called The Shack huge bestseller, um, in which Young represents God as a um, African-American mama. Um, Anne Lamott, a wonderful writer, uh, talks about the matriarchs, the black matriarchs, the African-American matriarchs uh, that make up the core of the Presbyterian church she goes to in California, and how special their embrace of her and acceptance of her and healing of her have been. And so I pray that I will never tire of using and living into these words, ambassadors of the forgiving and reconciling love of God in Jesus Christ. And that we will continue to do that in community together. Amen. Thank you. It's uh, always wonderful to realize that we are creating space for that kind of talent and creativity that blesses us so deeply. So let's say together again our Brentwood Declaration as we recall the story of God's saving mercy and grace. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and declared them to be very good. God then created humanity in all of our diversity to cultivate blessing throughout the world. Rejecting the limits of their power, our ancestors rebelled against God's vision of goodness. And by continuing to rebel against God's constraints, we compound the pain of toil, tyranny, trauma, and death. But God never gave up, as the Spirit reveals in the scriptures. In a definitive act of reconciling forgiveness, God became incarnate among us. In the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus of Nazareth, God restored the original goodness of creation as a commonwealth enjoyed on earth as it is in heaven. The Holy Spirit continues to work out the fulfillment of that act. Through the church universal in which we participate, the Holy Spirit nourishes us to flourish as God's friends through worship, learning, fellowship, and service. By God's grace in Jesus the Christ, through the Holy Spirit, we know what it is to be loved and to love amidst all the problems of the world. And we are equipped, empowered, and sent to sow the seeds of God's peace in all of our circles of influence. In the end, God's love will transform the heavens and the earth and will bring justice, peace, and joy to every dimension of creation. So here are a few things uh, that are happening. Uh, next Sunday afternoon, our session, the governing board of the congregation will meet in our Zoom boardroom. Uh, if you have anything that you would like this governing council for the congregation to consider, please let Pam Wong or myself uh, know. Pam's email is on the next slide about giving money, um, and mine is jazzthinkbrian at gmail.com. We'd love to hear you, and we will make sure that those um, suggestions or concerns get on the agenda. Uh, we are in the midst of the next phase of our feasibility studies for renovations and expansion to equip us better for our church purposes and for being a community arts center in North Burnaby. We've been talking about this now probably for five or six years for those of you who've um, started to hang around with us a little more recently, uh, but we're still exploring what's best to do. And we'll be arranging full consultations with the congregation in May or maybe into June, depending on uh, how we get this organized, to consider ideas that you might have about the best ways forward. So we've got some ideas already that have been generated about, uh, among the congregation, but we're open to others to continue to consider. So sometime this week, we'll distribute the options that we've currently imagined that are under consideration, and we'll invite you to comment on those and suggest others uh, if you have them. Uh, one of the things that we, the session approved this week was the hiring of Caden Gordon and Tyler Murray for our two Canada summer jobs positions this year. So as you remember, um, we uh, got two Canada summer jobs for 14 weeks, 20 hours a week. Um, and uh, Caden and Tyler have both been very much a part of, of Brentwood's musicking, especially. Um, and so uh, they're both deeply involved in what we're doing there. Uh, they're both aspiring young jazz musicians, very talented young jazz musicians. Uh, they play in the big band, they, they play in, in uh, Grand Slam, which is Ben's uh, traditional jazz group. And what they'll be doing, which we think will um, benefit them greatly in their chosen career, we'll be interviewing those who we intend to serve in our renovation expansion. So the music and community. Um, also those who, we, who in Vancouver have been running community arts centers well over the last few years. Um, but also they'll also be, uh, be uh, talking with people and Stephen Shearer will get involved in some of this. They'll be talking with people about uh, ways of funding all of this, perhaps through sponsorships, donations, 
Um, so it will be a kind of general set of conversations that give us a better sense of the lay of the land, both in terms of how the space would be used, but also how do we uh, provide sustainable funding for the running of the place. So lots of things to be um, explored, and we are deeply grateful for them being willing to do that with us. We're in the process of getting pictures taken of them, so we'll actually be able to see their their glorious faces soon. <laughs> no, since we can't get together in person and, and meet them. Um, we are deeply grateful again for your continuing contribution to God's generosity through Brentwood. Um, checks to the church, e-transfers to Pam, um, or there's a donate button on the top left of our homepage, Brentwood PC. Uh, pcc.com. As I mentioned, these are the, the hymns that we sang the first time we looked at this passage. Um, so that wonderful Wesley, Charles Wesley hymn, where um, love divine all loves excelling. And this is a hymn that draws attention to where that love is already active mm -hmm. and inviting us to align with it. There we go, that's better. Just a word about that hymn. It was written by uh, Frank Mason North, uh, written in the early part of the 20th century, just as that first wave in North America of large uh, urbanization and immigration and industrialization was taking place. Uh, the churches were trying to figure out how do they address the social difficulties and the social problems that were emerging in those those densified um, centers of population. And I find it, I can't remember exactly when North wrote those words, but a century ago, century or more ago, uh, but every time, and I, it's 760 in our hymn book, there are six verses in the hymn itself. And uh, I'm amazed every time I read that poetry, how pertinent and relevant it is a hundred and some odd years um, later. This image uh, on this Mothering Sunday for our prayers of the people is done by a good friend who just retired as the Presbyterian minister at Canada, at, at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Canada, just outside um, Ottawa, Sean Seaman. Sean was a student of mine back in the days when I was uh, um, adjunct faculty lecturing at Knox College and in Toronto. And in his retirement, he's picked up his passion for painting. And this was, uh, and given us permission to use those images. Uh, so this was one that struck me as being uh, particularly powerful for this morning. So our prayers for the people, please, uh, again, unmute yourself if you would like, uh, or write your prayers into the chat box. Reg, of course, uh, Rick Thompson, who's waiting for a double hand transplant, a good friend of Rick's, um, is in COVID delay in his hospitals down in the States. And so Reg also wants us to remember um, the caregivers uh, there and, and elsewhere. And families who have lost their mothers Thursday, um, we uh, gathered in, in grief, but in celebration to bury uh, Terry Wells. Um, so Terry has been, um, and I, I, I use this with, with great 
fondness and respect, this language of one of the matriarchs of, of Brentwood for years. She was 96 years old, um, died of an aortic aneurysm. Um, so went uh, fairly quickly. She was just in the midst of having to uh, move out of her house because she needed more care than they were able to, uh, uh, to provide for her. Uh, but had planned, um, she was the lady of the carrot cake, the person who brought the carrot cakes um, the last Sunday of every month to celebrate the birthdays in the congregation. Um, and so I'm told by Pam and I think Ben that we do have that recipe. <laughs> but she was looking forward to spending the summer um, growing some carrots, so the, the last crop of carrots in her garden out back of her house on, on Union Avenue. So we remember Terry and her family, um, especially. And then um, Deb was saying in the chat before the service that uh, her son and daughter-in-law um, have contracted COVID. So we keep them in our prayers as, as they recover from that. And Ben, a dear friend of yours, is home. Ah, in England current or in India currently, um, lost ten friends and family um, in the last uh, in the last month. The the raging pandemic in India um, is a course of concern for all of us. So many of the students that I work with at City University in the Ethical Leadership Program. Uh, masters um, or the, the bachelor's in um, leadership um, business there is, are, uh, are of Indian origin and still have family and friends there and, and have suffered losses as well. So we remember that situation. Yeah, Max, the, the, there are millions. Something like 400,000 yesterday um, were diagnosed with the, with the disease. Well, let's continue to pray. Um, forgiving and reconciling Lord. As families come together, remembering all those who mothered among them and for them on this day in ways that seem strange and, and strain for us, Help us to appreciate and celebrate whatever connections are possible, whatever ways of breaking through our isolation and loneliness we can imagine. And comfort us in the midst of everything that's happening to us, in the midst of diseases and uncertainties with, with diagnoses and, and uh, other sources of, of stress and strain. Assure us of your presence with us and for us. And help us hear even more deeply the rich embrace of your forgiving and reconciling love that you expressed when you were in the flesh among us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Desmond is with us. 
So as we sing the nine teachings of the apostles yet again, um, we listen for Des leading us in that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-composure. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-composure. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-composure. And a little child shall lead them. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I'll give you just a moment to look at the many artists who have graciously given us permission to use their art worth work in our Sunday slides. We are deeply, deeply grateful to all of them for enriching our worship in that way. And thank you for participating with us. Um, whether you were able to be here in purpose in our or in person in our Zoom sanctuary, or whether you are viewing this after, we are delighted that uh, we have you with us in this worshiping. And you can find out more about our missioning at our website. Take care and God bless, folks. <laughs>